Hebrews chapter 12. Beginning in verse one, it says, therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And verse three, our new verses for this morning, for consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. The first thing that I like you to note as you are studying this passage with us today is that we're encouraged as Christians to consider him, to consider Jesus. As you go through your life, I would like you to consider Jesus as your example for how you should think, how you should respond, how you should speak, how you should act. Wow, that's a novel idea. Christians be like Christ. You know, in this life, there is a weariness that goes deeper than being physically exhausted, mentally fried, or emotionally drained. There's a weariness and discouragement that hits your soul. And from verse three, we are encouraged and really need to realize that Jesus endured the sin against himself as a man and was patient with those that were sinning against him as God. Do you realize that? That not only were they treating him this way as a man on earth sinning against him, they were also sinning against God at the same time. And so at face value, Jesus went through at the very minimum double of anything that we will ever experience in our entire life. That was the minimum level. Double of anything that we will endure, Jesus endured. So when you're thinking about it, when you're stressed out, Jesus endured through more. When you're tired, Jesus endured through more. When you're sorrowful, Jesus endured through more. When you're alone today, Jesus endured through more. When you're in pain, Jesus endured through more. When you're mistreated, Jesus endured through more. And we could go on and on and on. And so church, are you still thinking about quitting? Do you think that you cannot endure? Jesus went through more. And so the author of Hebrews says, consider Jesus who endured such hostility, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And so practically our problem lies in not looking unto Jesus, but comparing ourselves to other people. I wonder how many of you have ever been guilty of comparing yourself to someone else. You probably did this morning if you happened to open up social media and scroll through Instagram and thought, how come my life's not like that? Why do I have to do this? Or why do I have to go through this trial? If I am in that place, then I'm not looking unto Jesus, but I'm looking at my situation. I'm no longer having faith in Jesus, but I'm leaning on my own understanding. I'm trying to figure out why I'm the one that has to endure these things and not someone else. I'm no longer considering Jesus and his example that he set, but... I'm comparing myself to other people and the race that God has called them to run and what God has called them to do. In Isaiah 28, verse 12, from the New Living Translation, it says, God has told his people, here is a place of rest. Let the weary rest here. This is a place of quiet rest, but they would not listen. They would not listen. I wonder how many of us today don't listen to the instruction of the Lord who says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I wonder how many of us ignore the encouragement to wait on the Lord so that you might renew your strength, that you might run and not grow weary and walk and not faint, that you would mount up like wings of eagles. When we don't listen to the instruction of the Lord, we'll never be able to find rest and we'll be constantly worn out. 
If I'm worn out, I'm less likely to run my race with endurance. I'll be less likely to lay aside every weight and every sin. I'll be less likely to look unto Jesus or consider what he endured because, listen to this, because I'll be more concerned with why it is that they over there are not having to endure what I am enduring over here. And then I'll be discouraged in my soul. And then I'll get depressed and then I'll get down and then I'll get apathetic and then I'll think it's all hopeless. But even here, in verse four, it says, you have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Meaning your faith in Jesus hasn't led to you being killed. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? When people around the world today are being killed for their faith in Jesus, and we look at our problems and we think, ah, oh, you know, this is so terrible, this is so difficult. And it may be. I'm not saying that it's not difficult, but Jesus endured more. I may look at my problem and think, I can't get through this. Jesus can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You might be in that place, like I said, mentally fried, emotionally drained, physically exhausted. Just this trifecta of difficulty that you have to push through. And then you look unto Jesus. You find that he gives you everything that you need when you need it. You're able to push through and not be discouraged. You're able to fight your good fight and run your race to win. I love what Spurgeon said, and I'll give you a paraphrase. And he wrote of Jesus where he said, Jesus never swerved. Therefore, you do not swerve. Jesus looked to that finish line. He stayed focused on his mission that he was to accomplish, to lay his life for the sins, lay his life down for the sins of the world and to do the will of his father. But in verse five, we see the key here for all of us. If you're truly seeking to apply the things that you're learning today from God's word, in verse five, it says, and it's really the most important statement regarding why we become discouraged, and it's only three words. Are you ready for this? You can look at them in the New King James Version that I'm reading to you from. You have forgotten. I wonder how many of you have forgotten. In verse five, it says, you've forgotten the exhortation which, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. Verse six, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So just to jog your memory in context, the Jewish Christians to whom this letter was written to, the Hebrews that were following Christ were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus there in Jerusalem. It was causing them to be discouraged. I wonder how many of you here today have been discouraged in your faith. I wonder if you've been put down or ostracized or made fun of. See, what the Jewish Christians had forgotten is also what we forget from time to time, that it is God that will allow difficulties to impact our lives. There will be challenges and there are things that you just don't understand. And the pain of those situations would be more than you could bear. And you ask the question, like, why would God do that? Why would God allow these things in my life? I immediately go back to our study on the life of Joseph. Don't forget Joseph. Look at the things that happened to him. If there was anybody that could ask, why would God allow these things to happen to me? It would have been him. Lord, my brothers hate me. They threw me in a pit. They sold me into slavery. They told my dad that I had been killed by a wild animal. I not only sold to slave traders, but I land up in Egypt in a nation that I don't speak the language and I am the lowest possible place that I could be. I get sold to the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Potiphar was his name. His wife tries to seduce me over and over and over again, and I resist it to the point where I have to flee out of the house, and then she accuses me of trying to rape her. I get thrown into prison, though I was innocent. And then I'm innocent, and I meet two guys that were thrown into jail by the Pharaoh, the baker, and the, and the cupbearer. I am able, by God's grace, to give an interpretation of the dreams that they had, and they came to pass. And I told them, hey, if you get out of here, please don't forget about me. But they do. 
And so I stay in prison even longer. And it goes on and on, and you know the story, but really, all of that is encapsulated with what, in what Joseph says in Genesis 50, verse 20. He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Because Joseph just wasn't where God needed him to be yet. And the Lord allowed all of those things to strengthen him, to deepen his character, to prepare him to be the right hand of Pharaoh so that he would save many lives from the famine, terrible famine that would hit Egypt and the surrounding regions for seven years. And see, time would fail us to go through all the hardships that these sons and daughters of faith that have gone before us have endured. And we've studied many of them. But Joseph was not yet where God needed him to be, his character, his faith, his dependency upon the Lord. I wonder if any of that resonates with you today. Is the Lord working on your character? Is he deepening your faith? Are you becoming more dependent upon him? Because the Lord is going to raise you up to be bold and to be courageous, to stand up for righteousness and to speak that's, that which the Lord has called you to speak. And sometimes it means enduring that which was meant for evil so that he could say emphatically, and I think we all are able to, at some point in our life, look back and say what man meant for evil, God meant for good. And it's because, from my own personal reflection, it's because I love my children that I have them work hard. That they endure things in school and sports and life that they don't necessarily like or enjoy in the moment. Nobody likes the pain of weakness leaving the body, but they all love the results. If I didn't have to work hard but could get there, oh, I would do that in a heartbeat. But so too, if you think about this, God being faithful to complete the work which he started in you will cause all things to work together for your good because you're called according to his purpose. And you can hold fast to that. You're his son. You're his daughter. And there are corrective programs that the Lord will use and there are strength programs as well. Both are used by the Lord. Both are used by the Lord to bring about his will in our life. And so don't forget that he corrects and he chastens those that he loves. That he will guide you back to the path of righteousness if you're veering off. He'll strengthen you through the difficulties that you face so that you might be ready to fulfill that calling that he has upon your life. And in verse seven, it says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Verse eight, but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So additionally, God comforts us through our pain and in our suffering that we may be able to comfort those through the same, that with the same comfort that we received when they're going through difficulty. And because you're a son, because you're a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he will use things to correct you. He will have things in your life if you're getting prideful to humble you. And hopefully we get to that place where we say, Lord, give me your grace. You give grace to the humble. Not just, you know, with our lips, man, I'm the most humble person that I know. And we don't want to be in the place where the Lord is causing us to be humbled or to learn a lesson the hard way. But if we are truly his kids, can we not expect for the Lord to teach us, to instruct us, and to guide us? We can rebel against it like we're some kind of teenager. Or we can say, Lord... Not my will, but your will be done. In verse nine, it says, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness." When we read this, I feel like, did not our hearts not just melt? Sometimes just understanding 
a little bit more into the heart of the Lord and his plan for us helps us endure the things that we're needing to endure. That we're to subject ourselves to the wisdom of our heavenly father and the measures he's taking to work in us. It's not pleasant, but it's happening for our own profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. When I am in error, if I have sinned, I should expect the Lord to correct me. I should expect the word of God to speak to me and give me direction for life. I should have the Holy Spirit convicting me and showing me what I need to do. And often our flesh doesn't like it. And I would, all, I would go as far to say is that always our flesh doesn't like it. Our sinful nature wants to rebel against the Lord. I don't wanna hear instruction. I don't wanna be encouraged to walk on the narrow path. I kinda wanna do things my own way and pick and choose what I wanna believe of what God's telling me I should be doing. But if you truly subject yourself, and as Jesus said, and that's why we read, consider him, Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. I look to Jesus as my example to model my life after him, to do what he did. We have that relationship with our heavenly father that transcends our relationship with our earthly father in that God is perfect in all of his ways and when correction comes our way, it is given perfectly and in perfect love. In verse 11, as we start to see more of the heart of the father revealed for us in verse 11, it says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. When you get busted, it's not like, woohoo, great. It's actually meant to not be comfortable. It is meant to get your attention. It is meant for you to even think twice before doing it the next time. Sometimes punishments and corrections can be deterrents for making that same mistake down the road or even to make it at all. But we've already established that God has a purpose for each of us and a work that we're uniquely called to complete. And there is no chastening that presents itself as a joyful occurrence, but God's word says that it is indeed painful. It does hurt from time to time. But regardless of the pain, it brings the fruit of righteousness out of your life after you've been trained by it. You know, we have some athletes and some pretty high level athletes in this church, some professional athletes, and they can talk to you about their training program and the things that they endure at the highest of all levels. Nobody wants to go through that, but they want the results at the end. The same thing applies for our walk with Jesus, that our father will instruct us, he'll teach us, he'll, he'll raise us up, he'll put us on a training program, so to speak a spiritual growth training program, a strength program, an endurance program. And we all go through it. And when we go through it, we're like, oh, I wish this would end. But when you get through it, you look back and say, wow, Lord, look what you have done. I'm not the same man that I was. The things that used to cause me to panic and have anxieties, they don't bother me anymore. The things that used to keep me up worrying all night. I have found that God has provided always and I get a good night's sleep. And you'll start to see how the Lord uses difficulties and trials and spiritual training to make you into who you're supposed to be. And it brings the fruit of righteousness out of your life after you've been trained by it, according to what verse 11 says. So you're having a difficult time. Okay, that means the Lord is working in your life because you're his son, you're his daughter. You're struggling in your marriage and you're having things that you have to work through. Good, that means that you're his son, you're his daughter and his hands on you and he's not gonna allow you to do what is wrong without having it checked. You're walking with the Lord personally in your own life and you're struggling behind the scenes and the heavy hand of the Lord is placed on you so that you might feel his presence. That you might be strengthened. That you might be aware that what you're doing needs to change. These things are good and they're indicators that you're truly a son or a daughter. 
He chastens those whom he loves. He doesn't chasten those whom he hates. The Bible doesn't say that. It says you actually find that you're a part of the family of God when the Lord is correcting you lovingly and perfectly. And even as Olympic athletes would train and experience the agony of conditioning their bodies, the end result made them into a better, stronger version of who they previously were. Progress. There's been a lot of this talk happening in my home about enduring things that are difficult, doing things that you don't want to do things that you actually kind of are really, really not looking forward to. But then you push through. You do what you know you're called to do. You walk obediently before the Lord, even when it's not pleasant and it's not nice. And then you come out on the other side and you look back and you realize, oh, I could see how the enemy was attacking me beforehand to discourage me so that I wouldn't step out and do what God had called me to do. I can see now in hindsight, because I just put my head down and went forward with what God was calling me to do, that the Lord is now showing me the areas that Satan wants to trip me up. The very, very strategic sin that wants to encompass me and grab me so that I can't run my race. And so if I can get tripped up before I take a step, then I'm not even going anywhere to begin with. And so all of a sudden, that spiritual light bulb turns on. Ah, now I get it. Now I understand why the Lord had me endure these things. Why he had me push through when I felt I was going to die. How the Lord showed me more of who he was and more of how he helps me in my time of need and how now my faith has been strengthened. Because we're not yet who God needs us to be. The chastening from the Lord, it isn't a punishment as some would see it. You know, sin, listen to this, has consequences in and of itself. So without anything from the Lord coming your way, sin by itself leads to death. And oftentimes we think, oh, you know, I sinned and this consequence is God's punishment. No, the consequence is the end result of sin. You can choose to sin and you will reap what you sow. You can choose to sow or invest into righteousness and you will reap good things. But for the believer, Though sin has consequences in and of itself and sin leads to death and the soul that sins will surely die, the Bible says, when it comes to the correction, instruction, training, pruning, or purifying of the Lord, this is a divine work of God alone. A divine work of God alone. In John 15, verses one through two, Jesus said, I am the true vine, And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the Lord will trim out areas of your life. Things that are maybe rotting or decaying that are not bearing good fruit. Some, for some, it could be a rival throne where you're worshiping another God. You're not worshiping Jesus and you had something else in the number one slot of your life and so that's gonna go snip. That's not staying. We're removing that. The Lord also purges you. He purifies you. He cleanses you so that you might bear much more fruit. And as you abide in Christ, as you spend time reading the Bible and in prayer and in church and fellowship and serving in being involved, you'll find that as you abide in Christ as a branch to the vine, that the Lord will purge that which is not good. He will prune back that which needs to be removed so that you may be as fruitful as you possibly can be here on earth. That you would bear much fruit. That the things coming out of your life would be so pleasing to God that it would be without mistake the Lord's work in your life and people would look at you and they would see the work of Jesus. 
good fruit. So the way that the Lord works as a loving father is that he chastens us from the condition of the heart and then that moves outward. In the world today, you ask people how you get to heaven, they say, be a good person. I think we all know that. To some you know, extent, they'll say something along those lines if they believe in God and believe that there's a heaven. And often people will think, well, you know, I gotta clean up my life. I need to stop drinking so much and partying so much and using so much and, you know, hanging out and, uh, and doing these things that are wrong. You know, I got to stop doing all of these things. Got to stop cursing and, you know, sleeping around and doing all of these hallmark sins. I got to cut those out of my life because then God's going to be pleased with me. And we think mistakenly that this cleansing process works from the outside in. I clean up the outside and hopefully it makes its way inside. But you know, Jesus addressed that issue with the Pharisees, didn't he? He said, you look nice on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. The issue has always been the condition of the heart. It has always been sin. You don't get to clean up the outside and it makes its way inside. No, you come to Jesus personally. You put your faith in him. That's why for you today, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have to go and have a good week and come back next Sunday and say, okay, now I can give my life to the Lord. No, you come just as you are with everything, all the dirt, all the filth, all the mistakes, all the sin, all the regrets, everything. You come to the Lord and then he cleanses you from the inside. And then that change, as you're made alive spiritually, as your heart is purified, as your mind is purified, then the things that start to come out of your life are indicative of a heart that is right with God. It doesn't work the other way around. It's not the outside in, it's the inside out. And so the Lord, as a loving father, he will strip away or will remove those things that are of our sinful nature and not of the spirit. Because from our desires, from our heart, comes our actions. And so the Lord acts to create in us a purified heart that brings about pure living. I love this from Psalm 119. I'm going to read verse 67 and verse 71. It says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. In the Hebrew language, which Psalms was written in, as you know, the Hebrew word afflicted can be translated to be humbled or to be brought low. The Lord chastens us in our areas of pride and self and the lust of the flesh so that I might receive grace. For guess what? God gives grace to the humble. When I get checked by the Holy Spirit, I'm convicted. When I'm chastened by the Lord, I'm humbled. When I humble myself before the Lord and submit to his will, he lifts me up as the new creation in Christ, fit for the Father's work. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, it says that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Amen to that. I love the work of the Lord in my life and it's usually after the work of the Lord in my life is accomplished. During the time, it's like, Lord, what is this? Because you have to know that Satan as that roaring lion seeking who, may, who he may devour is going to try to harness the instruction and correction of the Lord and say, God hates you. God doesn't love you. He has abandoned you. Look at this difficulty. Look at this pain. Look at this struggle. Why would God allow you to go through that? So don't think that that's not going to be plain in your mind as you look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. That's why we read, look unto him, consider him. He endured, you endure. He was afflicted and he pleased God. You can be afflicted and please God. If you're going through challenges, know that the Lord is chastening those whom he loves. 
And it's actually telling you more about you being a part of the family of God than Satan trying to tell you that you've been excommunicated from it. And so verse 12, it says, Therefore, after these things that we've just studied, it says, Strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. I was so encouraged by this. I hope that you are too. If you're finding yourself in a down and out moment, stop being stooped over and wallowing in your discouragement. It's time to rise up in the strength of the Lord and have him strengthen your hands and your feeble knees. Make straight the paths for your feet. Speaks about getting back in the action of God's calling upon your life. Allow the Lord to heal you and move on. Submit yourself to the work of the Lord in your life. Verse 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Listen to this. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears." We are to pursue peace with all people. And if we're doing what God has called us to do, then we will find that we are not the cause of problems in other people's lives. Let me say that again. Pursue peace with all people. And if you're doing what God has called you to do, you will find that you are actually not the cause of a problem in somebody else's life. You know what a blessing that is to not be a problem to somebody else? May the Lord bless all of you here today that are not a problem to somebody else. What an instruction where we're actually the keeper of the peace, not the destroyers of it. And when we're walking, and when we're walking in holiness before the Lord, then others will see Jesus. See, Christians, or professing Christians, that are not holy are a problem to the church. Sad to say, but it's true. But when we're holy, what a blessing we have become. Yet, in our own lives, and I wonder how many, I wonder how many of you here today will have this specifically speak to you. That in your life, you have to watch out for roots of bitterness in your hearts. Where we start getting angry, having animosity towards somebody that probably doesn't even have a clue that they have offended you. You start building up all of these terrible thoughts and feelings towards someone because of how they treated you or what you think they said. We have to guard ourselves even against legitimate offenses causing us to be bitter towards somebody else. It can be a legitimate problem. It could be an actual offense. Guard your heart against bitterness. We are given Esau as an example of who not to be as he traded that which was important for that which was the lust of the flesh. Now granted, Sometimes saying something bad about somebody may feel good. Maybe even saying it to them to their face, letting some steam off, describing, you know, what kind of not good person that they've been. That's a lust of the flesh. That's not pleasing to the Lord. And your words actually are describing a condition of your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, as we're looking at Esau as who not to be. It says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, 
But sorrow of the world produces death. See, godly sorrow will come from the chastening of the Lord. And the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow is repentance. Where I turn and change. And when I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit of my sin and God begins this process of purification and purging and pruning, my sorrow should lead me to turn from my sin. To repent, to go in the complete opposite direction. And the Lord will use those things because you're his son and his daughter. You know, that kind of language isn't appropriate. How could you say you're filled with the Holy Spirit and you're using foul words? Can a spring bring forth pure water and bitter water? These things are irreconcilable. So, okay, I'm convicted that my language that I'm using is not glorifying to God. And if I'm saying things that are not glorifying to God, then that's speaking to a condition of my heart. So, Lord, I need your help. Forgive me and cleanse me and purify me. And Lord, help me to turn from it. And now in verses 18 through 24, we're gonna see a comparison between the law of Moses and Mount Sinai and the grace of God from his holy city. Again, if you're joining us for the first time, the context of this letter is that, and many believe to be Paul, is writing to a group of Jewish Christians. They formerly were a part of Judaism. They gave their life to Jesus, and now they're being persecuted for their faith in Jesus there in the city of Jerusalem. And so we're going to see a lot of Old Testament pictures as we've studied through the Hall of Faith and going all the way back through the Law of Moses and of the priesthood of Aaron. But in Exodus 19 and 20, if you're taking notes, you can just jot this down in your margin, or if you're taking notes somewhere else, you can write this down. Exodus 19 and 20 and Deuteronomy 9, you can read for yourself, and I will say this very seriously, you can read for yourself the fear and the dread of Moses and the people of Israel to get anywhere near the Lord on Mount Sinai. You can read about it and you will be shocked because there was such a fear and dread of getting close to the Lord. And so writing to the Jewish Christians, they had to now see a difference between this Mount Sinai occurrence where Moses interchanged with God on behalf of the people and Zion, the place of Jesus' death, which removed the wall of separation between a sinful man and a holy God. There is going to be now a contrast given, and I want you to understand that that's what we're going to be heading into in verses 18 through 24. From fear and dread to going to the Father boldly, from a place of the law of Moses out Mount Sinai and where grace is received through the cross at Zion. And so in verse 18 it says, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow." And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said in verse 21, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. That's picture one. The second is found in verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, in verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Big picture. If you've studied with us from the beginning of Hebrews until now, you would have seen a contrast of the law of Moses and the grace of God how that Jesus fulfilled everything in the law of Moses, that the law of Moses actually pointed to your need for a savior and Jesus was the fulfillment of those things. 
And it says here at the end in verse 24, Jesus' blood that was shed for the sins of the world was greater. And some mistakenly have thought, well, Abel was killed by his brother Cain. That's not what is being discussed here. The blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for the sins of the world was greater than Abel's animal sacrifice. That animal sacrifice that Abel gave unto the Lord was a righteous offering. But even more righteous and greater than that was Jesus laying down his life for the sins of the world. This was the new covenant between God and man through Jesus. In Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for, the, for many for the, remission, for the remission of sins. That's why we're gonna be observing communion here today on the first Sunday of the month. We don't want to find yourself. We don't want to find ourselves. You don't want to find yourself refusing the words of the Lord. You look back at Mount Sinai, those who rebelled before Mount Sinai, they didn't escape. They broke the law, they paid the price for it. But even so too, those that rebel against the work of Jesus on the cross will not escape the judgment of God. And this is what it says now in verses 25 and 26. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they, speaking of Old Testament, Mount Sinai did not escape who refused him, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. So let's break this down. First point to note is the Lord has been known to shake things up, hasn't he? And he will get our attention. And he's known to do that. And that's good. But he shakes those things that can be shaken so that which cannot be shaken remains. And this isn't speaking, you know, in code. What this means is that the Lord will remove the things from your life that are unstable and he will bring stability to your faith. So that when those things are shaking, these things in the earth and there's situations that arise and all of a sudden my world gets turned upside down and you know I got let go of my job or I got a health crisis or whatever it may be and things are getting shaken, you will find that that which can never be shaken is your life of faith built upon the rock of Christ. Your personal relationship and connection to the Lord, though the world might be shaking, this will always remain stable. It's been called the anchor of your hope. Jesus referred to building your life on what he says and then doing it is like building your house on a rock. And this world's all over the place. Up is down and down is up and left is right and right is left and wrong is right and right is wrong. Not for the follower of Jesus. I always know where I stand. I always know what is truth. I always know what is right. I always know what the word of God says. And so no matter what may be happening out here, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Paul, speaking of knowing the problems that were ahead of him in Acts 20, as we come in for a landing here in verse 24, it says, but none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He had just listened. You read uh, Acts 20, the preceding uh, verses. It will just talk to him about all these. He is talking about how all of these things that are just terrible await him. And he just says, none of these things move me. Why do none of these things move Paul? How do none of these things that you're experiencing move you? Because you look unto Jesus and your house is built upon the rock. In verses 28 and 29, where we close this morning, it says, therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence 
and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Anything that's not of the Lord, Lord, burn it up. Anything in my life, Lord, that is not of you, remove it. And you know, the Lord's not very good at phasing sin out of your life. Oh, let's kind of take the, you know, the next eight months and kind of phase you out of this sin. No, it's like it gets uprooted immediately. Ah, ah, Lord, take those things that are evil in my life, remove them and place them with something, replace them with something that's good. And he is a consuming fire and the fire of God's spirit will consume all that is the lust of the flesh. So guess what? And this is where I'll leave you today. So that which remains is the purified, the strengthened, over and over again, time and time again, faith. Purified, strengthened, faith in Jesus. And so if you're going through the ringer, look unto Jesus. If you're having a hard time, consider him. He endured so much more than we will even get close to. And that's why he's able to be your present help in your time of need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your faithfulness to us that even when we're faithless, you remain faithful for you cannot deny yourself. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for giving us such an example that we might follow Jesus, you, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, gave us that example to follow after. May we emulate ourselves after you. And so Lord, I ask this morning, for those going through difficult times that may have believed that you hate them or are severely just wanting to hurt them, striking them with a lightning bolt, Lord, I ask that they would have a paradigm shift today that would go back to your word as we remember those three important words. Have you forgotten that the Lord chastens those whom he loves? That he teaches, that he trains that he removes things that are not good. He prunes back those things in our lives that are bad fruit so that we might bear much more good fruit. And so I ask that we would see things differently today, Lord, as we look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And with every eye closed and head bowed, I'm gonna invite the men to come forward who are gonna be distributing the elements of communion today. And I'm gonna ask that if you're here, and maybe you've been going through some things where you have seen your difficulties or your struggles as opportunities to think that God does not care for you and that he is not at work in your life. And if you would like to be free from that, very simply, if you would like to be able to have that spiritual insight to how the Lord is going to be using these things for your good, then with every eye closed and head bowed, if that's you and you've been struggling back and forth with that thinking, I don't know how this is good. How could God who loves me allow this to happen to me? Maybe your faith is being challenged. If that's you here today and you would like to be free from that and push through that and step into maturity and stronger and deeper faith, then would you just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me, Garrett. I'm wrestling with some things and I feel like the enemy's using them to discourage me and I, I need to see the Lord through this. Would you just hold your hand up so I could pray for you today? Right on, you guys. No more shall Satan deceive. The truth shall make you free, the Bible says. Jesus is the truth. And may he open your eyes. And may you hear his voice. And so, Father, I pray for these all over the auditorium today that have raised their hands, Lord. We ask now that you would give them clarity and give them insight. Lord, you endured so, mu so much. It, it was referred to as hostility from sinners. And Lord, we've been in some pretty hostile environments. We've endured some pretty difficult things. But Lord, I ask for these that have raised their hands, they're your sons, they're your daughters. You love them. Maybe there's correction taking place. 
Maybe there's discipline taking place. Maybe there's training and strengthening of faith taking place because we're not yet where you need us to be. And you said you can be confident of this very thing. Your word tells us that he who has begun a good work is faithful to complete it. And so Lord, I pray that there would be a humbling before you as you work on their hearts and their attitudes, the way that they think and view life. I pray, Lord, that you would give them spiritual lenses, wisdom from your Holy Spirit, and that you would encourage them, Lord, lest they become weary and discouraged in their souls. If they have come to this place weary and discouraged in their souls, thank you that you are now lifting them up. Thank you, Lord, that you have reminded them to look to you and that how all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And so bless these, Lord, that need that touch from you today. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to be pleased with your church. And we ask for your blessings now in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. 